Welcome to Uncaged, the show that celebrates thought leadership from today's top business leaders. The program provides a voice to amazing executives from around the globe who are shaping the world of business today and mapping the path to the commerce of tomorrow. Today, we're speaking with Dana Bryson. Hey, Dana, how are you? Great, Dan. How are you today? I am well. Dana is the Senior Vice President of Social Impact for study.com. Study.com enables learners and educators to meet their academic and professional goals through K-12 curriculum, college courses, tutoring, and test preparation. They have a very scaled footprint. We'll talk about all of the exciting things they're doing for, for students as well as teachers, really kind of working on improving our educational system more broadly. But before we get there, Dana, Tell us a little bit about yourself and your career. Thanks, Pat. Uh, thanks for having me on today. I'm really glad to be here. You know, uh, a desire to improve urban life has really shaped my career. I've spent a couple decades now, happy to say, working at the intersection of urban government, tech startup, and nonprofit innovation. And so it's really working at that intersection where I've been focused in my career. And I've spent a lot of time, more than a decade, on a senior as a senior appointee to U.S. mayors. So was chief of staff for Jerry Brown when he was mayor of Oakland, and chief of staff over city operations in Washington D.C. on the mayor's cabinet in Denver, and really learned a lot about um, policy and this intersection um, with business. And so, really been um, working at that intersection um, in my role here at Study and. Um, I also do a lot of volunteer work. I, I chair the board of an international nonprofit called World Child Cancer that treats wow. children with cancer in low and middle income countries. We're in about 13 countries, treated about 8,000 children last year. And wow. so that is a pretty meaningful part of the work that I do. Um, and also um, have, I'm an urban farmer. So um, help to start DC's largest urban farm, the Common Good City Farm and have been working for about two decades to help uh, uh, urban communities grow their own food. I love that. Uh, I could talk all day about that. That's a passion of mine as well, Dana. Oh. But instead of talking about farming, let's, <laughs> let's stick to education okay. and yeah. really what you and the team are working on at study.com. Tell me a little bit about the story and where you guys are. Absolutely. So Study.com, you know, you already mentioned this, but we have been in business for two decades. So we were founded uh, with a wonderful story. We were founded by Adrian Ridner and Ben Wilson over two decades ago when they were in college. And Adrian, um, our current CEO, came to this country um, in high school, didn't speak the language and couldn't find the access to education that he needed. And so he and Ben started this as students, for students and teachers. And that was, you know, that was over two decades ago. So what is it? We were country when country wasn't cool. You know, we have now 30, over 30 million um, learners and educators on the platform a month. Um, and so, you know, that means that, you know, every two minutes a learner enrolls in a course on study.com. We um, have a full K-12 curriculum for fourth through 12th grade. Um, we have over 1,500 test prep courses. So, when, you know, when you need to study for the ACT, the SAT, also professional courses like the nursing or teaching exam, MCATs. Um, and then we have um, almost 300 college level courses so that you can help um, with transfer credits or to reduce the cost of college by studying on our platform. So um, been here about four years, thrilled about the work we're doing. We're seeing um, a lot of growth. We're um, completely bootstrapped, no outside investment, very profitable. Wow. I mean, it's a really interesting time in the educational space. I mean, certainly anybody who had children lived through the challenges of what it was like to educate during COVID. But tell me a little bit more about the challenges right now. I mean, we hear topics like teacher shortages, and I know you guys are working on things in that space. Yeah, we sh we absolutely are. And, you know, as a fellow parent like you, you know, I um I think our kids were in third and fifth grade during, you know, when COVID really hit. And, 
you know, so I experienced it both as a parent and also as someone leading, you know, larger in initiatives in the education space. You know, when COVID hit study, because we had been doing this for two decades, we knew we already, we all of our academic content was already online. And so what we did is we just did uh, massive donations of, you know, about $22 million worth of product donated to primarily Title I schools so that we could mm -hmm. do our part to try to help immediately. But really what we're focused on right now is um, to try to put more diverse teachers, to build a more diverse teacher pipeline and mm -hmm. have more prepared educators in our schools. Uh, I think, you know, you've probably been reading or as a parent been experiencing what it's like to have a teacher shortage um, in this country. And really it's a, it's a shortage of, a, of diverse teachers. Um, yeah. And we know that one of the biggest barriers to becoming a teacher is passing the test. Yeah. So you can study, get your bachelor's degree in education or a specific subject, go on to take the one of the national certifying exams to be a teacher. And we know that 50% of folks who take the test um, will fail the first time and 25% will never pass. And that the final pass rates are really abysmal for uh, students of color, for Black, African American, and Latin Hispanic students. So that's what led us to create uh, the Keys to the Classroom initiative to really make sure we are diversifying America's teacher, teacher pipeline and getting more diverse educators in the classroom. So I can talk more about what we're doing there and who our partners are, but... Um, yeah, I mean, I can see how the dearth of teachers right now is a real challenge. And diversity has always been a challenge. And I think clearly boosting that, finding ways to broaden that out and making uh, really what I'm kind of hearing here, Dana, is making that into a sustainable structure, kind of getting it going. So we don't have these kind of dips all the time is going to be key. But I mean, I would just be curious. I was reading the other day about the impact of COVID on kids these days. You know, they were saying that maybe kids are a little bit behind, you know, because of the whole COVID thing. What are you guys seeing with that? And what are some of the actions that are taking shape in that space? Yeah, learning loss has been incredibly significant across all race, ethnicities and ages. And, and we know that a lot of that is attributable to COVID. And it has been a watershed moment. I think, you know, COVID has changed um we're going to, you know, technology is changing things and we maybe talk chat G GPT a little later if we'd like, but, you know, COVID has really changed, I think, the way we relate to each other, um, the way we relate to business, the way we relate to technology, and it's, and it's no different for education. We yeah. need to, you know, we need to serve up education in ways that people are going, that's going to matter for the learning outcomes. And that needs to continue to look differently for different groups of people at different ages. So it's just, we're not an agrarian economy, right? And so this nine to three, nine months a year, butts in seats is, uh, can be important and we need to have alternatives. So we need to have hybrid, we need to have blended learning, mm -hmm. we need to have on-demand asynchronous, and we really need to put, we need to make sure we're doubling down on valuing our teachers. I imagine, Dana, that the solution that study.com has would have been front and center right during the pandemic. I remember those those early days speaking with the board at my kid's school as they panicked to try to figure out how they were going to make a curriculum that they could operate from home. So I can completely imagine that you guys would have been front and center. But, you know, as we're coming out of this, and obviously kids are back in the classrooms, what are we seeing that's being held on to in terms of the digital learning structures? And what else is being evolved, perhaps? Yeah, so it's a great question. I, I know that what we're seeing, and we, you know, we partner with 1,500 universities. We've got users in 10,000 school districts around the country. So I'm really got my ear to the ground a lot with our partners. Um, they need flexibility and they need choices for their students. Um, all learners learn differently. And so um, one of the things that's great about studies curriculum is that um, it's all video based. Um, we use animation. It's micro lessons. So it's seven to 10 minutes. And so you can, 
we get great feedback from educators about how effective it is to be able to use this curriculum, stack, stack it the way they need it for um, the learning that needs to happen. And so I think to have um, you know, teachers at the center, educators at the center, at the end of the day, that's who's going to be helping our students and that's who we need to be relying on. But really provide technologies that are educator designed and responsive yeah. and that show um, empirical evidence around learning outcomes. You know, we are very focused because we've been doing this two decades. We know a lot about what works and we've got a lot of data and research around what works. Yeah. in terms of learning pedagogy, in terms of different types of interventions. So I think to be able to offer that, we're really hearing that from our educator community and being able to offer one-on-one -on -one kind of high dose individual support to really, um, in addition to that. So it's sort of the, the scale and the vastness of what technology can provide yeah. and, and the personalization of this one-on-one -on -one to say, let's really talk about quadratic equations and really work through the thinking behind them to help, you know, tutoring um, students to help with that learning loss that we mentioned. Before. Yeah, I really like that. Educationally designed and supported by empirical evidence. I love those key points. Well, Dana, you brought it up and I feel <laughs> like I got to ask, you know, I was on the phone with my high schooler yesterday and uh, he was talking about chat GPT with me and uh, tell me how that's uh, impacting the classroom well um you know it is I keep I'm trying to think about which um, natural natural weather event analogy I want to use is it a <laughs> is it a tsunami is it a hurricane I'm not sure is it a tidal wave but it has washed ashore um I think uh, and made it very clear what AI can mean for education, what artificial intelligence can mean. And um, I think right now, and we just did a survey on chat GPT, and um, I, what I can say is that um, there's a lot of uncertainty and fear around what does it mean and is this yeah. the future. And I think um, I, I'm concerned that, um, you know, it's like when, Alexander Graham Bell had this thing called the telephone and everybody freaked out about what it was going to mean for communication. I think it is a bit of that moment with AI to see what chat GPT and other tools like it will mean for learning. Yeah, I think it's an opportunity. I think it's an opportunity. And what I hear from educators is that um, they are looking, they're going to have to change the way they educate to have more uh, bring more curiosity, bring more interactivity, bring more, um, um, you know, sort of bring it back to basics in terms of new ways to show understanding that aren't about necessarily spitting out an essay, right? Yeah. They're need to, because it's here to stay. It's the genie yeah. out of the bottle. No, I mean, I was thinking that it does change things, but, you know, a couple of years ago, I completed a PhD and mm. you know, one of the processes, one of the things you have to go through is essentially an oral defense of your, your PhD. And I feel like that may become commonplace, right? That maybe, maybe that's what's going to happen with your essays and your papers that to really understand that the student knew what they were doing and that they built the argument, you're going to have to almost go ahead, you know, tete-a-tete -tete in a way, right? Well, right. And think about your own experience there. You know, you know how much, I mean, it was your PhD. We Ooh. sure hope you knew it. I'm sure you did. But when you had to defend it, you better believe you could really speak to the nuances about it and answer questions. And from a lot of these innovative educators we're talking to, they're excited about, um, I mean, I don't want to sugarcoat it. I think there's a lot of concerns about cheating. Yeah. What we saw in the recent survey that study.com put out is that um, essentially the, the older the student population that the teacher teaches, the more concerned they are. So right. elementary school teachers, not so aware, not so concerned. College teachers, very aware, pretty concerned. But we saw some mixed reviews about what that concern was. Yeah. One thing that was interesting that I saw, which I felt was really promising, is that in our survey that we put out at study.com, 72% of college students believe that chat GPT should be banned. In mm. 
And that was the one that left me really curious and wanting to know more. And I think it has to do with this intrinsic sense of fairness that our students want. I mean, they, yeah. they, they, if you're working hard for something, that ethic, that ethos is there. That's a really interesting point. That may be a generational thing too, because you're absolutely right. I've noticed that with my teens peers, as well as that generation, they are very meritocratic in terms of kind of how they would expect some of these things to go. Whereas, yeah. whereas I think maybe the Gen Xers would have been a little bit more opportunistic, like, yeah, I'm never going to have to write a paper again. Right. Yeah, that, I just, you know, it, it made me it made me feel good as a parent, you know, yeah. an educator to know that, hey, you know, three quarters of these college students say, I don't want to get I don't want to get it through you know, unjust means here, you know, I, yeah. I, I want to earn it to own it. And so, um, but I, I do think there's a lot of fear and my, you know, I really am encouraging in, in the, with a lot of the uh, education and district leaders we work with, you know, free yourself from fear around this. This is the future. Let's really figure, let's put parameters on it. And yeah. open AI has been wonderful in their um, kind of mission uh, of making sure that this is really a, used for good and and not taken advantage of so but it's awesome. out of the bottle so we'll have to see absolutely well dana here we are in this brave new world so 2023 what's on the docket for study.com well you know our keys to the classroom initiative is really taken off so um we looked at the data around um the lack of have you know we didn't have enough diverse teachers in the classroom and identified that pax, passing the praxis or another certifying test was a huge barrier. So we built an initiative to donate our teacher test prep materials to innovative uh, teacher certification programs around the country. To date, we've donated about 6,000 licenses to 25 programs in 20 different states. Wow. We're, we're um, donating and we're you know, we, we know that with our test prep materials um, that folks pass generally at a 92% pass rate across the board. And so we knew that this would be, a we knew it was a really effective tool that had good learning outcomes. And so we're partnering um, just this week, we announced a partnership with the Grow Your Own Center in Tennessee and the University of Tennessee system to donate 2000 uh, free licenses to any teacher cadet that was going through that program. And um, in our program, we've got predominantly more than 50% of teacher cadets identify as teachers of color, and more than 60% are first-generation college students. Wow. So we're really feeling good about, um, you know, our part. And we've got partners from state agencies to unions to um, large nonprofits. A lot of the programs we're focused on are focused, um, the partners are focused on Grow Your Own, which means keeping teachers um, from your own community and edu so working with oftentimes paraprofessionals, so folks who've been teacher's aides, mm -hmm. uh, which is what we're doing in Clark County, Nevada, the uh, fifth big biggest uh, school district in the country is partnering to, with 1,400 paraprofessionals there to help um, get them test prep materials and have them get an accelerated bachelor's degree in 18 months. That's great. That's so we're great. very focused on that. Um, very focused on our, the work we do with school districts. Uh, as I mentioned, we're in 10,000 school districts. And so um, working a lot with school administrators, um, we recently got certified, we talk about learning outcomes in um, ESSA, the Every Student Succeeds Act, which is uh, an objective third-party certification that you get to show that your learning intervention has positive outcomes for students. And so we're going, um, we just got our level four certification pretty soon. We'll be focused on level three. And that's, as someone who sat in the public sector seat for a decade as, you know, working for cities and making yeah. choices about spending public money, I know that um, our partners need to know, hey, if we spend money on this for our students, this is, these are tax dollars, yeah. you better show me how it's going to work. And so we're really, um, because we've been doing it two decades, we've got a lot of data. So well, you know, the great thing, Dana, is I hear a lot of promise and a lot of excitement and opportunity here. You know, certainly we're at a moment of change in the education space, 
but a lot of good things here that you guys and the team at study.com are putting in place. Dana, if somebody wanted to learn more about what you and the team are working on, where's the best place to reach you? Yeah, they can, um, they can just go to study.com and um, click on keys to the classroom and they can reach any, you know, get any information they need there through the email and the phone number that's there or hit me up on LinkedIn, Dana Bryson on LinkedIn. I'm really happy to uh, talk more about the work that we're doing um, and also talk about urban farming if anyone wants to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Dana, thank you so much for being on the show today. We've been speaking with Dana Bryson. She's the Senior Vice President of Social Impact at Study.com. Study.com enables learners and educators to meet their academic and professional goals through K-12 curriculum, college courses, tutoring, and test preparation. They're used in over 10,000 school districts across the nation. And as Dana mentioned, They have been recognized by Every Student Succeeds Act, ESSA or ESSA, for meeting level level four evidence standards. So congratulations about that, Dana. And excited to check in and hear the latest on study.com in the future. Thank you, Matt. Wonderful. Great to have you on the show. Okay. Cheers.